Hiya, I'm Nuka, social representative of the Kali Nuka Martis Collective. We're an autistic gender fluid dissociative system and we write books. I, group spokesperson Nuka, am non-binary, which means whoever I'm attracted to, I'm being gay. Some people might say whoever I fancy, I'm being straight, but those people are wrong and I don't need that kind of negativity. Anyway, the following stories are all inspired by my life. My life didn't come with a content warning, but maybe it should have. I'll be nice and warn you now, these scenes contain swearing and references to severe mental illness and childhood trauma. I tried to make them funny though, because you've got to laugh, haven't you? I'll begin with an excerpt from the third chapter of our first book, Toxic Nursery. This is when my adventurous but insecure alter ego, Honeysuckle, thought it would be a grand idea to capitalise on the often problematic fetishization of femme bisexuality. One copy of the pseudo-pornographic music video, Honeysuckle Blue, still exists somewhere in the cramped studio of an unknown visual artist. Preserved on cheap, rewritable compact disc, its name scrawled on the front in permanent marker, the film presently hides from a world that would gladly tear its vulnerable starlet to pieces. The scratched plastic casing contains a clumsily fitted front cover, a screenshot printed on low-grade photo paper. You can see peachy tones of naked girl skin. You can see one of Honeysuckle's downcast eyes, all smoky green eyeshadow and numb oblivion. Play the film and you get a seven second intro. The black screen morphs into a world of slow motion lesbianism to the sound of static noise. You might think you're watching a conceptual art piece until a song starts playing and you realise this more resembles an amateur music video that expresses the artist's inner pain. You are then treated to 11 seconds of heartfelt imagery. Lucky you. There's a disposable razor blade being dismantled, a thigh being cut open, and handheld footage of a nighttime walk towards an overpass. Images flicker in and out of each other, slightly in time with the music, but not really in time with anything. It wasn't exactly what Honeysuckle had in mind. She wanted to be a porn star. It was her intended means of financial survival. Every attempt to maintain regular employment leads to either Alicia ruining everything by smashing stuff up and cutting us open, or Anxia, our most terrified alter, being a hyperventilating, gibbering wreck curled up rocking in a corner. We are too crazy for the work normal people do, yet we cannot claim welfare forever. People who read tabloids will call us parasitic scum. I'll make us some money, declares Honeysuckle. I don't mind being naked in front of a camera. There's always money for women who don't mind being naked on camera, especially if they're kind of gay. The problem with Honeysuckle is she burns too easy. She cannot be trusted to make a cup of tea, let alone important life choices, without getting scalded and blistered. At 18 seconds, the vocals begin and the film cuts the Honeysuckle in the shower. This is back when she used to braid ribbons into long, messy curls, giving her the look of a doped up ragdoll. Her face is a typical drunken blur of bargain makeup and cheap aspiration. This footage was obtained at an after party, so the foundation she had bought from the market had already worn off to expose the shiny skin of her angular features. The emerald eyeshadow, which enhanced the shimmer of green in her light brown eyes, was still somewhat in place. But her low-priced mascara was an absurd choice for filming bathroom footage, as it ran in jagged lines whenever she cried, so it was unlikely to survive a shower scene intact. She does not think things through. Honeysuckle smiles at her girlfriend as though there is no camera. She knows the camera's there. She had always been watched. We all have. All our lives we've been infuriated by the incessant violation of our privacy. The main difference between the rest of us and Honeysuckle is she does not care for privacy and doesn't mind feeling violated. Basically, she got this ludicrous notion about making pornographic movies and we needed our own way of indulging her before we lost her to the predatory vultures. We need to take control of the situation she gets herself into. We thought, at least this way we can edit the footage. It won't be like before. It's always reassuring to know where the camera is. We knew where the camera was because we had set it up, perching it on a stack of toilet rolls to get the correct angle before handing over to Honeysuckle. She promptly got into the shower with her co-star, the delightful girlfriend number three. This one made us feel guilty about our bisexuality, as though our former involvement with men had left us contaminated. She often boasted about how much gayer she was. I don't sleep with men, she said. I will never sleep with a man, ever, she insisted. I'm a proper lesbian. As though it was some sort of competition. It did make us laugh when, after we split up, she slept around, as many people do, and accidentally got pregnant from sleeping with a guy. Previously having a rather cis-centric mentality, we joked, nothing says failed lesbianism quite like an accidental pregnancy. But we've since realised the potential flaw in this statement. Regardless, she was not pregnant at the time of filming, 
She looked scorny next to Honeysuckle, who had spent the past three years taking antipsychotic medication. The meds never made us any saner, just sleepier, twitchier and fatter. We eventually replaced them with amphetamines to give Honeysuckle the lifestyle she had always wanted of sex, drugs and digital video. This whole experience was basically Honeysuckle's way of turning our difficult past to her advantage. When life gives you lemons, make digitally filmed lesbianism. Okay, that's enough about our honeysuckle. She is somewhat disturbed. It's not easy navigating this world as the personification of the libido of a mentally ill autistic person. Another character who struggles is Ash in our second book, Derrick and Hex the Viptalki. This is a cyberpunk tale involving vengeance and pie. The third chapter sees Ash surviving a precarious existence in an underground city prison. It is half a year before the hotel massacre and Leah's favourite former roommate is watching the crime channel in the media vision room of a dingy prison block. Ash is surrounded by fellow uniformed convicts. On a killing spree that began nearly two decades ago, she murdered 795 people, enthuses the programme's narrator, prompting a cheer from the assembled crowd of felons. Fists with tattooed knuckles punch the fetid air while raised arms reveal sweat patches on red uniforms. Yellow tinged strip lighting casts a dull sheen on shaved scalps. The prisoners have gathered to watch a true crime special on Alicia, the vicious teenage killer who wrecked havoc when Derrick and Hex was still due Le Ronde. Their scratched and dusty media screen dominates the southeast wall. Monochrome footage shows a young woman dressed in black with blood smeared on her face, aiming her gun at the vulture camera as it flies towards her. The visuals freeze on the final frame before she pulls the trigger. It's important to remember how different Derrick and Hex was back then, an eloquent voiceover explains. Before everything turned to shit, growls Ash's cellmate, a murderer built like a mountain. Yeah, before the damn fags took over, adds his muscular, tattooed acquaintance. Sitting apart from the others, Ash leans back and sighs, wearily running fingers through gelled back hair. The fuck is your problem? demands the nearest testosterone-laden felon. Absolutely nothing, Ash replies, eyes fixed on the screen. I fucking thought so. She continuously evaded all law enforcers. The commentary continues. Her brutal crimes happening in the most unexpected places. She was an enigma and even our top investigators could never predict her next attack. I'm sick of hearing about this bitch, declares Ash's cellmate, changing the media screen over to a comedy channel presently on an advertisement break. A few convicts appear disappointed at this alteration, but the guy holding the remote is the most colossal sociopath in their block, so they say nothing. The next program begins and Ash gets a nauseous feeling of disgust while the rest of the crowd erupts in barbarous amusement. They have switched over to the new Stan Velovic comedy vehicle. Stan has become a media sensation since his infamous vulture trial and now hosts a show attacking unpopular women for sport. Hey there, welcome to my show, Stan beams, grinning under lurid yellow lighting. This guy's a legend, crows a felonious fanboy. Catch it, he'd be my prison bitch if his daddy wasn't loaded. I reckon he's the poisoner, somebody adds referring to the latest big name in morbid entertainment. He's gonna fess up on the last episode of this series. I'd fucking bet on it. Nah, mate, the poisoner's that lethal Alicia. What the fuck's the poisoner? Don't you know anything? They're this murderer who gets you with this slow-acting poison that burns and blisters the skin off your lower body then makes you fall into a coma. The vultures haven't caught them and the guards can't figure out who they are. It's fucking hilarious. It's because their poison takes a few months to activate, but once symptoms kick in, the victim's only got a few days in a coma before they die. Yeah, and the only way to reverse the poison is by killing the poisoner, but nobody knows who they are. Haven't they got a weird birthmark in the shape of a car or something? The convicts continue to discuss the latest famous murderer, while on the media screen Stan has found new prey for his brutal antics. Ash is about to get up and walk out in disgust when a couple of guards arrive alongside the new clerk. The mousy woman clutches a batch of envelopes against her flat chest, surveying the room with shy, darting eyes. You got any love letters for me there, darling? inquires Ash's cellmate, with a stare that manages to combine both contempt and lechery. Sorry, I've only got this for your block. She apologises to the room, holding out a solitary envelope. It's for, um, this person here, she utters, passing the lone piece of paperwork to Ash. Nicely put, Ash grins. Are you sure that's a person? wonders the group's gargantuan leader, invoking hysterics from the obnoxious pack. The clerk blushes and tells Ash, I'm sorry, I didn't want to assume your pronouns. No worries, Ash says. I'm non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. A better choice of word might be it, jokes Ash's cellmate, as his underlings nearly collapse in another fit of laughter. 
The dictionary definition of it is a pronoun referring to a non-human animal, plant, inanimate object, concept, or sometimes a small baby. Ash responds, never an adult human. You're supposed to choose either he or she, mate. I prefer Ash. But what are you? I am what remains when the fire has finished burning, but I can be fire again. Very funny. Fucking hilarious. But are you male or female? Of course not, don't be ridiculous. Wait up, interjects the confused felon, scratching his head. How can you be they when you're a single person? Yeah, the guy next to him concurs. You can't use they in the singular, dumbass. You guys did just then when you were discussing the poisoner. Ash reminds them. The room goes silent while a great deal of laboured thinking occurs, and Ash uses this opportunity to open their post. I mean, they're not wrong. But apart from this scene, their gender identity is rarely referenced in the narrative. The rest of the story is mostly overly dramatic fantasy revenge sequences. My final recital is about my trans male alter ego, Cal, in our third book, Chroma Kalanuka. In this scene, Cal recalls his first memories of trying to escape from a world that misunderstands his autistic and trans identity. Cal has a therapy appointment with Dr. Ravishti. He usually enjoys the company of this insightful professional who never expects him to mask his incompatibility with humanity, but today's mention of childhood results in an unexpected panic attack. Curled on a chair in the doctor's office, rasps of laboured breathing emanate from Cal's crumpled form. Are you able to articulate what's causing this state of panic? Dr. Vavishti's voice echoes from miles across an empty chamber. Cal clutches his knees, head tucked inwards, lost in a lightless realm. Peblash wreck, he gasps. His skull brims with images of nightmare space opera. I remember it all, the wreckish uprising, the Guax alliance, Kalanuka's sacrifice to save Chroma. The surviving wreckish hordes preparing their next attack, infecting the minefields, converting everyone to soulless evil. This is just a story, Dr. Ravishti insists. Your brain generates 42% more information than average. Modern human society, where everything is loud and simple, simultaneously overwhelms and bores you, so your mind created a whole galaxy in which to entertain and hide itself. But this fantasy amplifies itself, becomes a paranoid delusion, a safe place you paradoxically need protecting from. Until you deal with your underlying depression and anxiety, these issues will follow you into the dream. Cal still struggles to breathe. He survived today's shift, but will remain in the work trap until Leandra resorts to prostitution. Life is a cruel prison. He hits his head four times. Please don't punish yourself for what life has done to you, the doctor says. You are safe here. You have no enemies in this building. The wreckish human hordes are not real. Just as you created the idea of them, you have the power to make them disappear. But Kalakai said, the crib, Cal whimpers. Crib is an interesting word. Dr. Ravishti's voice is still miles from Cal's hidden face. You speak of demons arising from the crib, while also saying you barely remember your childhood, and your comorbid mental illness is invariably caused by trauma. What happened in the crib, Cal? Cal opens his eyes to view the woven plastic threads of his trousers. He sits upright, still clutching his knees, and stares at Dr. Ravishti's forehead. A chamber of wreckish intergalactic botherment was dropped on this mindscape 32 years ago by the demons of Peblash Wreck, Greysphere in the outermost orbit of the Chromosphere system, furthest from the central glowing sphere of Hugh S. Bereth. The doctor shakes his head. All this happened in the world you created to escape your reality. Cal hopes this is true. I shall ask again, what is your first memory, Cal? The schoolyard, final year of primary school, my peers sprinting maniacally knocking into each other, yelling random catchphrases barely worth whispering, the overwhelming need to escape their belligerent chaos. Cal clears his throat. I remember curling fetal in the corner of a playground to escape from sensory overload. The doctor makes a note. And how did your peers react to this behaviour? With an onslaught of questions. Me pressing my face into the 90 degree angle created by two concrete walls should have made it obvious I was not receptive to conversation, yet their questions persisted. So, your first attempts to escape reality were unsuccessful and you needed space. Cal taps his leg repeatedly while a dry laugh escapes his throat. How dull were their lives for a boy hiding in a corner to aspire such fascination? I only sought a temporary break from bombardment, but this violated their ridiculous social etiquette. How was I so damn perplexing? 
They bellowed meaningless utterances while plastering their faces with inane smiles. The boys were pathologically obsessed with moving a ball with their feet, despite said ball being a dull, mediocre object no matter its location. The girls wore overpriced beauty products to emphasise existing features, rosy gloss on lips already pink, mascara on lashes already dark, hairspray to clump hair strands into one lifeless object, and nobody asked why the boys didn't wear makeup or the girls didn't kick a football. An entire array of life choices decided by the shape of their genitals, and nobody questioned this, yet everybody demanded an explanation for why an overwhelmed boy would hide in a corner. Dr. Vavishti smiles. I think we've discovered the root of your anger here, Cal. Trauma from the crib. Cal manages a weak smile in return. It would be comforting to believe his fears of wreckage attack were a complicated metaphor for childhood bullying, yet he cannot shake visions of scarlet eyes glowing through shadows. And the plot just gets darker and more surreal from this point. Crazy alien times. Well, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening. These books are all available from the world's biggest online retailer or from our little site at carlymartis.com or you can follow our socials for more weird videos. Thank you so much. Goodbye.